Um, we are in the office of the uh, GGR at the moment, and we've been trying to get together with Robin for a while. So <laughs> those that don't know Robin, this is Robin Davy, <laughs> and he's uh, uh, an interesting kind of sailor. Uh, done uh, three BOC challenges, three round the world, three BOCs. That's with stops. So you know, three, three, four legs, three stops. <laughs> back in the 1990s okay and wanted to do the this ggr but wasn't able to but has entered the 2022 race so um um so we're just going to talk about generally sailing southern ocean uh, some ideas and theories on um uh you know boats and equipment and tactics in the southern ocean and obviously about our situation and and what's happening with some of the the entrance right now so so the first thing that i think we'll get into we'll try and replicate we have some amazing conversations mm -hmm. sometimes and we know that as soon as we turn the camera on <laughs> we'll probably lose it and won't go anywhere but anyway um we had an interesting conversation today with mark slatt's phone call um which you can see on the facebook page on the soundcloud um, and mark was saying wow you know these boats are always under sailed he says they're light because he's always got a reef in a reef or two and in the southern ocean there's squalls everywhere so it's very hard to set the um, the right amount of head sail versus mainsail, and that brings up all sorts of ramifications. And for the first time, Mark has actually admitted, hmm, maybe I would have liked to have had head sail reefing gears. So, so do you want to? Can you give us a description on the way you see the Southern Ocean? Typical day in the Southern Ocean and trying to get from Cape Town through to Australia. How would you call it? <laughs> well, I I would call a typical day. You know, the winds are twenty five thirty. 35 sometimes 40 miles an hour 40 knots so the winds are up and down the winds don't really stay very stable very very long they kind of move up they move down so you're constantly wanting or needing to increase sail area when the wind goes down a bit and decrease sail area when the winds you know bounce up a bit so sounds like head sail reefing to me <laughs> Sounds to me like a roller furler for the head saw is absolutely essential. I've always had one, and I certainly don't want to try you know, doing it with Hanks. Yeah, you know, from my perspective, I've only done one. He's done three. Mm -hmm. But anyway, when I was going around in the Southern Ocean, I had a very simple tactic um, because there would be these big clouds that would come through, and the cloud could be the size of a football field or it could be the size of a city block or even a city. And every time you're under those clouds, the wind increases 10 knots. So if it's blowing mm -hmm. 25 to 30 under the cloud it's 35 to 40. So during the night I would set the boat up with reefs and everything to cater for the wind under the cloud okay and so then in between the clouds the boat's going slow but I didn't care because it was night time and I didn't want to break anything. During the day I would get up shake the reefs out and set the boat up for the wind between the clouds and that meant that when the clouds come over and the squall comes in, you've got to get up on the deck and reef the boat. You've got to furl in some head sail or even put a reef in the mainsail. And that's what Mark will be missing, I reckon. Yeah, I think he's got a, he's got a hard row to hoe to, yeah. uh, you know, to sail around the Southern Ocean with hanked sails. So that means a lot of work every time he has to change a sail. It means you try to hang on when you, you know, feel... I ought to be reefing in a bit, but it's a lot of work and it's very cold and it's very wet. And if you can make that real easy and quick, like with roller furling, then you're out there, you reef very quickly and then you get down below again and get warm. So, yeah. you know, and the same with your mainsail reefing as well. If your mainsail reefing is easy, you can drop a, you know, a reef in the main and, you know, let it out, put it in, let it out very easily, very, very quickly. Hang on, hang on. You've <laughs> got your mainsail reefing at the mast. Yeah. <laughs> I never have it at the mast. He's got to go up on deck and reef his mainsail. I do mine from the cockpit like Jean-Luc. <laughs> well, that's one way of doing it. And you know what? I shall probably try that in the next year or so. <laughs> well, you you're know. getting younger. <laughs> I'm getting older, so I've got to find ways to make things easier. It's a classic here because the different entrants have done different things. And to reef the mainsail from the cockpit, you put you bring all your halyards and your reefing lines back to the top of the cabin top and in the cockpit. And I, I so many times I've come out in my thermals, you know, because you've got to tuck a reef in quick and you're under the spray dodge and you can quickly chuck a reef in. But if you've got to do like this fellow and go to the marsh, I'm going to get wet, cold and miserable and I'm a bit of a boy scout, you know, <laughs> and a bit of a girl. <laughs> hey, don't get me I hate being cold, I hate being wet, and there's nothing I hate more than a great yeah, wave yeah. dumping on top of me. Exactly, and it's fun to watch because different skippers are doing different things. But here's another issue. Um, the whole thing in the, in the Southern Ocean, I would always relax when I got rid of the entire mainsail. In other words, when you've got big seas and big winds behind you and you're roaring along, 
you're always worried about the boat slewing around, so you'd reef the main more so than you would reef the headsail. So you're pulling from the front of the boat, right? You know, you'd be the same. Absolutely. Sort of yeah, and eventually you go down to the third reef of the main, so you get rid of the main entirely, and you've got some part of a headsail or a stay sail or a storm jib, but it's pulling the boat. Don, now, I go to a fourth reef, <laughs> and I, you know, seriously, I still like to have that little oh, yeah. bit up. But yeah, yeah. A fourth reef is very small. It's a lot smaller than a trisail. Yeah. And I've found it's worked well for me. Yeah, and, and what I'm leading to is that pulling from the front keeps the boat steering uh, better. And yep. so if you're on piston hanks like Mark is now, and I'm not criticising Mark, I'm just trying to give you this is the differences, um, is you're more inclined to put a smaller sail up the front, leave it there and keep raising and lowering your mainsail because it's easier than going up and dropping a sail, putting it in a bag, taking it down below, getting another one out, all those sorts of things. Now what that does is that has a tendency when it's pushing pushing from the back of the boat rather than pulling from the front. And so the boat's likely to slew around more, makes it harder work for your wind vane, and it makes it more likely for a jibe, right? So, and that's what you don't want, because when you jibe, especially, or if you broach on a wave, mm -hmm. that's when you're gonna get knocked down. Now, Robin just, I said to Robin just before this interview, hey, uh, how many knockdowns? You, yeah, no, I said, how, you haven't done a rollover, right? And I've never and, rolled over. But Touch what, wood, I'm yeah. touching a lot of wood when I say but it. Then, but then, tell um, me what you just told me about knockdowns. I don't ever feel I've really had a knockdown. I mean, I know I've had the boat way over, but I don't think I've had the mast in the water. Yeah. Um, so my thing there is I just try to keep the boat moving. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe in speed. Well, geez, I remember, I remember I counted every one of my knockdowns going from Cape Town to Sydney. I had seven in the first, uh, first leg, I think it was. It's that long ago. And 11 in the, in the well, it's the first leg, the... Cape Town to Sydney, mm. then there's Sydney to Cape Horn. One was seven, mm. one was 11. Um, but I actually had a 360 rollover. There was three of us that rolled in, in the third leg of the BOC. Kanga Bertles from Australia, he stayed upside down for like 10 minutes, remember? And the only reason he came up again, because the hatch was open, the forward hatch, and let water in, and the free surface area inside the boat made it unstable, and it flipped up. So he was a bit worried. But just to describe what, what uh, Ari would have gone through, when I went down, I was in the navigator's chair, I went backwards on the chair, so it was like this, and I thought, oh, here we go, another knockdown. Um, and you knew exactly what was going on until you basically got inverted, and this happened pretty quick. And after that, you thought, what the hell's going on? Because you couldn't comprehend doing the whole 360, and you get pushed over to the other side and dropped around and bouncing, and the light changes because all the windows are underwater, the sound changes because it's all muffled through the whole thing. And my whole sequence, I reckon it went through in about 30, 40 seconds, something like that. It wasn't long, maybe a little bit longer. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. Um, and it was like, whoa. And then the first thing you go for is the rig. <laughs> you think, whoa. And I had a horrible noise and I thought the rig was gone, but I didn't see it and it was still there. And that's another story. If you want to see it and see Robin in 1990 as mm -hmm. well, you can see it on the, my knockdown video. It's got a video called McIntyre Knockdown. It's on YouTube and it was about the the BOC race back then, and it yeah. includes a knockdown sequence. I filmed one with the mask going down into the water. So it's it's very, um, very real. And uh, I think all the engines will be lucky if they get through without being knocked down and so on. Yeah, absolutely. And when you get knocked down, it's, it's very disorientating at yep. the time because yep. the movement is so fast, everything's changing, your upside is downside, and yep. it, it, very disorientating, you know, it's, yeah. it's tough. We actually heard some more news from John Amtrap, the uh, manager of Ari. He had a phone call with him, and uh, he actually got a bit injured. Um, only minor injury, a little cut behind his ear. He was uh, working on the wind vane breakaway coupling. Now, this is a part of a sequence, and some of you may not understand this one. On the wind vane, they have a servo pendulum rudder in the water, you know, that thing that goes like this, and it has a special tube on there that's designed to break so that if... Uh, anything overloads it doesn't damage the wind vane doesn't damage the gear and on a on an aries for instance it's a tube that looks a bit like this a straight tube and they actually uh, machine in it a, a groove a which weakness. means a weakness yeah so it's going to snap um at a set uh, tolerance and because it's heavy aluminium tube machined they can do that to within 20 40 kilos of braking load every time on the monitor which is the same as zari's got um they actually have a stainless steel tube and they just grind a bit out eh um, well, it's because it's, you had a monitor, didn't yeah, you? I yeah, I have yeah. a monitor. It's yeah. a slightly thinner portion of tube that buckles. Yeah, is Whoop. is is what happens. <laughs> it, it just buckles on you. So that's a very important navigation instrument. I, I know. Should say, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> carry on. <laughs> so I have, you know, down below a spare, a paddle with the next tube in it, uh, ready right. to go, so yeah. that 
if I do buckle one, and it's only happened to me probably four or five times in three races around the world. Yeah. So it doesn't happen very often in my experience, but obviously it certainly happened to Ari. Yeah. And I, I've got my spare paddle with the, new, the next safety tube in it ready to go. So all I've got to do is unplug one, get the other one in and, and bolt it. Right, yeah, because it's a bit of a pain, eh? You've got to lean over the back of the boat, you've got to undo oh, yeah. the bolts, yep. all that sort of stuff. Yep. So that was the second time that it happened to Ari in this storm. It happened once when that happens, you've got no wind vane. And on this second mm. time, he had to hand steer, he was hand steering for seven hours, had to stop, so he stopped, decided to hove too. I'll explain what that is in a minute. And that could have been the beginning of the major problem. And he was repairing that tube and getting it organized to replace when the rollover and uh, losing the mast happened. So he got bounced around a bit. Anyway, um, he survived all that. You know the rest of the story. He popped out porthole and so on, and he's, he's looking good now. Um, so um, oh, what was I just talking about? Oh, so there's another issue there. He would have used two tubes in one storm, like two knockdowns. Yeah. I don't know how many tubes he had, but he would have been worried about that. And as a, by the way, Susie's got the same vein. Susie's got a monitor. Um, who else got a monitor? Um, Uku has one. Uku's... Uh, no, Uku's got a hydrovane. He's and a, got hydrovane and a monitor. No, it? it's a, an Aries derivative. Is it's it? another one. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I think there's someone else there. I forget now. Anyway, so um, so it happens. It happens with Aries as well, and and uh, it's a design ish, design feature to stop damaging the veins. I think so. I I, I, I don't feel unhappy about you know my no, no, tubes no, breaking. Have it. That's what they're meant yeah, yeah. to do, and when they do it, then you don't bust the machine up. You yeah. just replace the bit. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Now, this is the next one we're going to talk about, being hove to. What does it mean? Some of you may know what it is and what it isn't. I'll go back to Jean-Luc. Um, I, there's this whole issue about towing drogues and slowing down, okay? Mm. And um, some people swear by it, some people don't. There's the next issue about lying a hull or hoving to, mm -hmm. right? So we'll go back to Jean-Luc. I did ask Jean-Luc the question whether he even had a drogue on board. And a drogue is, is like a canvas bucket or something to create drag that you then put on a rope and hang off the back of the boat. Now when, if this is the boat here, say, when you are going down the Southern Ocean, and this is the, make this the bow and this is the stern, the boat can slew around and do all sorts. But if you tie a rope way off the back, you know, 100 meters or something, with a dragging device on it, it's gonna keep pulling the boat back as the wind is pushing it forward. And if you put a little sail up, you can sort of go like that um, even without controlling the boat. You can lash the tiller amidships and as soon as it slews around, the rope will pull it back on track and so on. That's, that's the purpose of a, of a drogue. Um, but slowing the boat means the waves are coming past harder and faster and it's also meant to stop you broaching down a wave. When you get on a big wave coming down here, it's like a surf boat on the beach. It'll go side onto the waves, the wave breaks over and you roll, roll over 360 or you get laid flat. So. So anyway, Jean-Luc, uh, does he has a drogue on board, but he's like me. He's never used it in his life. He says very clearly he likes to keep the boat moving. Um, and I'm the same. Um, the tactic for Suhaili and Sir Robert Knox Johnson and his advice to other sailors is a drogue is dangerous because it's hard to pull in. It's hard to set. As soon as you put it out there, it's like this monstrous load. I know guys that have had their legs hooked up and had fingers ripped off uh, setting drogues and recovering drogues. So he ties a loop of rope. So if you imagine this is the back of the boat, it's a long piece of rope that goes like that, two ends. When you want to pull it in, you just pull one end in continuously on a winch and it slowly comes back together. Still the same idea of slowing the boat down. So Ari, uh, you can only steer for so long. You've mm -hmm. got to stop the boat somehow. He decided to hove too. And what you do then is, it gets a bit technical, and I'll explain it in a minute. Normally when a boat's sailing, you have a head sail on one side and a main sail on the other side, if it's if it, the same side, if you're on port tack, so the wind's coming over this side. But you turn the boat inside out. You put your, you, you put your head sail back the front, so it's back winded, which would want to normally push the bow of the boat down. And then you put the rudder the opposite way with the tiller across to steer the boat up. And so the boat's continually stalling, driving like this, and you're sort of climbing about one or two knots and the sail is fighting the rudder and the sail's fighting the rudder, but it's always done sort of towards the sea on a, on a angle to the bow, so you go over. And doing that, you're really prone to getting hit by big waves and possibly drop backwards and, and um, you know, other damage happening as well. So it, it, it's a debate which way you go. I mean, you can Google this as well. You'll see, you know, if you Google, there'll be stuff on YouTube and all about hoving to and laying a hull and so on. But the challenge for the GGR, no electric autopilot, you lose your wind vane, 
big seas, you can only steer for so long, mm -hmm. and you've got to either lay a hull or tow, tow warps, um, or the, the other option is hove two. I already went with hove two, um, you know, and uh, it was all, all bad luck. Uh, it could have been part of a current. They were in a current at the time with the waves and so on. Um, and uh, it's just unbelievable. I mean, we're all shattered about it. And all the engines have done different things to try and avoid it, you know, in terms of strengthening rigs and so on. You're just about to put your rig in. What's the single <laughs> most important thing to stopping a rig breaking in a rollover situation? <laughs> Gosh, if I had if I had the magic answer to that, I'd um, I'd be patenting it. You know, you know any rig. We all like to think and hope that our rigs are substantial, are strong, are well supported, are you know good and strong. But the sea will find whatever weakness is there. Yeah, yeah. It'll always find the weakness. Yeah. Um, over time, um, and then something will break. So. That's one reason why you know boats should go out and really test their boats beforehand. To, yeah, yeah. To to find where the weaknesses are and, yeah. and and so on. It's exactly the same answer I would have given. There's no way you can tell. There's no one thing you can do to stop a mast coming down uh, in a rollover situation. All you got to do is create a boat which is set up the best you possibly can for the Southern Ocean. And these and I've got to say, Ra is not only a good sailor. He's a professional seaman, mm. a commercial seaman. You know, he is really good. His boat was was prepared perfectly he will have gone he's, over that boat inch absolutely. by inch nut by nut he's, bolt by bolt wire by wire his he's, mass was just massive yeah right and yeah. um he we chatted this morning about the damage on the boat and so on and even ari's surprised he's uh he's, he's the the main bulkhead is pulled away from the hull he thinks the hull might have flexed in a little bit which popped the porthole and all that sort of stuff and uh it could have even been something along the lines that when the hull flexed and bearing in mind this hull is just dynamite maybe the rigging went slack at some point mm -hmm. the side loads the shock load or something like that it's just impossible because i got to say one thing uh, ari's preparation and uh you know planning was just impeccable and yet he still lost his rig yeah and i mean you know i said i'd never been knocked down my boat's been thrown around with me in it and i've been crashed over sideways onto the you know a few yep. and and the boat just it's it's like the boat's hitting concrete yeah yeah at the moment it gets thrown sideways by a wave and it's yeah. happened and you wonder what's going to break yeah that's your immediate reaction is to look up and think and start looking around for well what's broken yeah well, yeah, I must admit, when I had my rollover, it wasn't a bang, it was a swish, it was a speed thing, yeah. down a wave, yeah. like, you know, big broach, bloody down in the water, and then the rest of the wave coming back, and yeah. the gunnels tripping, and so it was a soft rollover, but um, you lost your mask, what happened? What was the emotion going through your mind? Explain that one, what happened, where did it happen? I mean, you just can't believe it at the moment, at that time, at that moment as it happens. Um, I was in the bunk, I was asleep, there was an almighty bang, and I was awoken with an awareness that something had happened and kind of levitated out of the bunk into my foul weather gear up into the cockpit and the first thing you always do when you come up in the cockpit look is up. look at the top of the mast <laughs> to look at the windex to see what wind wind direction is compared you know compared to the mast and it wasn't there <laughs> it, it was unbelievable it wasn't there yeah i must have looked for 10 15 seconds at what wasn't there there was a lot of snow going on up there oh yeah and eventually I kind of looked down and there it was way out over the side of the boat. And as I looked down the mast, I could see it was broken and stumped into the foredeck forward of the, you know, normal mast position. So oh, yeah. kind of ruins your night. Yeah. So what do you do? <laughs> well, it's no good calling AAA or RAC. Yeah, they aren't yeah, going to yeah. come and help you. Yeah. So it took me a few, you know, a, a, I don't know, it seemed like ages, but... You don't know whether to laugh or cry at that moment as you look at this and then all of a sudden the brain kicks into gear that you've got to do something about it. So, you know, we gathered together the, 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 the great big bolt cutters and hacksaw and blades and a load of tools, threw them up into the cockpit from down below and then started going around cutting everything away until the mast fell into the water and then it was lying down the side of the boat and yeah. it started to grind into the hull. Oh, that sounds like fun. <laughs> well, that's that's when you really know you've potentially got a, a big, big problem. So mm -hmm. you, you get pretty smart and quick at cutting away the rest of it, and it just all sank to the bottom of the ocean. Yeah, yeah. The only thing I took off the mast was the one spinnaker pole that was poled out, you know, was poling out the Genoa, so that it left me with the two spinnaker poles to build the jury rig. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. which you did do, and that's we uh, we um, mm-hmm. all the entrants in the GTR have to do a jury rig. And I sent them all an article, which was a yachting monthly article about jury rigs, which had a big story about you in it and uh, all the rest of it. So they all saw that, and they all mm-hmm. got out there and they did their jury rigs, and Ari did the same. And he's just found uh, he's got all the bits there. He set the manufactured special bits to fabricate or you know to set up the jury rig. So he's he's into it. And so um, how was you know with the twin poles and all that sort of stuff? So how hard was it to put it up? Because yeah, Ari's got to do this probably tomorrow. Well, tomorrow if the weather goes down and the, and the seas calm a little bit, he he'll just need to be organised. If he prearranged the lengths of all his ropes, he's going to be able to 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 hoist this V up and. If he's got his four stays the right length as the as the weight comes on them, then he's just going to tighten up the back, and it'll it it it, it should be a relatively it's it's not easy. Depends yeah. how much the boat's rolling around. Depends how big a swell still remains. How the seas go down. Yeah, yeah. Um, but for for me, I mean, it, it took me from six in the morning when it got light until uh, it was about six or seven o'clock that evening. Um, you were ready to go. I, well, I had the foresail up. Yeah. I had the rig up. The rig was really strong. I had massive you know, ropes, you know, my all my yep. sheets and yep. so on. Yep. Very strong ropes back to winches and really wound the whole rig very, very tight into the deck to yep. give it massive stability and strength. And up went the storm jib on the, uh, uh, you know, yep. for, the, as the foresail. Yeah, yeah. And away we went. Yeah, cool. Never yeah. looked back. And so how far did you go? <laughs> because it was halfway between Sydney and Cape Horn. Halfway so between was, New Zealand uh, and Cape Horn. Oh, it's yeah. over this side. Yeah. Other side, yeah, It's yeah. over this side then, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah. So it was way out there, Jane. Way, yep. out, way out here. So, yep. No, way down here. Okay. Way down here. So yep. all the way here in, in, into the Falkland Islands. Yeah, cool. So that, that was my... Uh, you know, jury rig. So it was, it was about 2,700, 800 miles. So Ari's just got a sprint, 400 miles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and Ari's already said, you know, I think the, the, the biggest problem he's got is, is the motion inside the boat. Yeah. When you take away the rig, all of a sudden, the whole weight of the keel becomes a massive pendulum that yeah. just whips. It doesn't even rock back and forth now to the swells. Yeah, yeah. The boat just whips, yeah. And when you're inside the boat and you're you 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 may not be quite hung on tight enough, you can get thrown literally straight across the cabin. Yeah, he mentioned that. He he, he thought he was worried about getting rolled over last night. He woke up one time. He was trying to sleep, and he said, sort of, "Whoa!" He thought he was going at one point. Yeah. Because it is. The, he said the motion was horrible. Yeah, the motion you know. is horrible. I mean, after by the time I got to the Falklands, I felt that I'd done ten rounds with Ali. I yeah, was yeah, yeah. beaten up, yeah. bruised, yeah, yeah. and battered okay. right right through. Yeah. All right, so uh, I think we've covered a lot of things here. We covered rollovers, knockdowns, wind vanes. You know, at the end of the day, this whole issue with RA is mm. caused by wind vanes again. Mm. You know, and it's, I'm not not knocking monitor. Monitor's a good wind vane, um, and everyone's having issues and stuff. I'm just saying how critical the wind vane is. Your wind vane is the key to everything. It's the only extra crew you have. It's the best friend you have. Yeah, and you know, if things go wrong, you've really got to get that sorted out very quickly and and you know get yourself back under the control of the wind vane to to me there is no value in trying to hand steer yeah um if you're hand steering your boat you can't be doing anything else you can't be repairing anything yeah. you can't be repairing the monitor you can't be adjusting anything you're set it, it's it's difficult it's real difficult yeah, so yeah. to my mind the instant you know you have a problem you have to fix it yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, just a couple of quick things to finish off on. It's funny about Mark Slat staying today. He's always under canvas, you know. You can never get all mm-hmm. the sail up. This is exactly what John Luke figured straight away, which is why he got a shorter mast. Yes. He's carrying less weight aloft and yes. compensated for the furling gear. Um, and uh, the other one is um, everyone's pretty upset because... Ari had a very interesting boat. Technically, the smallest boat in the race. Mm-hmm. Um, he's been sailing it really well. He's mm-hmm. right up there with the leaders. And, Terrific um, job. Yeah, amazing. So they say, oh, you know, it must have been the boat, or what was it, the skipper, or whatever. And and uh, now we've got people looking at boats for 2022. Mm-hmm. And we had a discussion on this yesterday. Mm-hmm. And and my take on it is that it's got it's got a little bit to do with the boat. But the key thing is, from my perspective, it's all about the planning the preparation and the execution. That's what's going to win the GGR. That's what's going to let all the adventurers finish the GGR. Because in the planning stage, sure, you choose your boat, yep. right? You then choose your equipment, 
right? You make all the, you do all your weather planning, you know, the years ahead, you know, you look at what's going on, um, look at what's happening in this race and all the previous races right back to 1968, because there's some things there with Matessia and Joshua and Suhaili and all that, you know, there's just information everywhere. It's always down to your choices. Yeah, absolutely. And so that's, that's the first one, that's in the planning stage. Then the next one is the, the preparation. And the preparation is all about getting the boat refitted right, um, you know, working to the plan you made in the, in the, uh, the first part, um, getting out there sailing a lot, right? And, uh, and getting yourself ready to go. I'll be a lot fitter by then. It's still, it's, and, that, <laughs> and that is still your choices. You Absolutely. Know, it's down yep. to your choices yep. every single step of the way. Yep. And then it's the execution. It's keeping, it's actually doing it, you know, and keeping your psychology right, you know, because at the end of the day, if you lose it up here, you will find a reason to not carry on. You'll yeah. say, oh, there's something wrong with the boat. There's That's something. absolutely yeah. it. I mean, at, yeah. the, at the end of the day, Henry Ford said, you know, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Yeah, exactly. And it's always <laughs> Hang down on, to... Hang on, that go again? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> if you think you can yeah. or you think you can't, yeah. you're right. Because, yeah, because if, if you look at the people now looking at 22 and talking about the boats... They're sort of saying, oh, you know, I've got to get this boat. It's the best boat thing, and and da da da. And said, yeah, that's true, but it's the total package. It's the total package, package, and you know. And I think if there's one thing I'm seeing or feeling from looking at, you know, the race so far as we've got it here going on now, is you know how many miles did various people do on their boats before the race start? Did they do the miles? Yeah. If you go out and do the miles you'll find all the things that are wrong with your boat and you'll change them and you'll, you know, get things squared away. But if you haven't done the miles, when you get out there and find it out during the race, it's too late to do a lot about it. Yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, so uh, that's probably enough. We're coming up to things. So I hope you've enjoyed all the computer graphics and all the extra things we've pulled in to explain everything that's going on, um, which we didn't. (laughs) But if you Google a subject, it's incredible what's on YouTube and what you can find there. If you look up Hove 2 or you look up, you know, Drogue or something like that, just Google it. You'll find all sorts of answers come up and uh, and you'll get a better explanation than than we can ever give. Anyway, we'll try and do it again. That was our first uh, bits and pieces. So in the meantime, we're still thinking of Ari. Good luck there and uh, all the other entrants out there, they're all coming in now. They want to go and offer Ari help. And I'm saying, no, no, he's okay. He's okay. He doesn't need anything. Ari will be <laughs> just fine. He's a very experienced Absolutely. person. He'll, yeah, yeah. He's, he'll be looking after himself okay. Yep. yep. And if you're watching the tracker, just remember, uh, Ari's tracker is now called Grab Bag. He's got a new color purple. It's called Grab Bag because the, the, this is the, oh, you've seen dear. these a lot of times. This is the YB3 texting unit, okay, that they normally send the texts with. Uh, and it's also a position reporting one. Uh, he damaged the one in the boat that he's been using all the time. The tracker sender, the YB3I on the back of the boat's not working. That might have got damaged in the rollover as well, we're not sure. So he's had to take the spare one of these out of the grab bag and uh, we've now commissioned this and that's what you're looking at on the tracker. So this will give a position every hour, so you'll see him up every hour. And uh, he's also got his sat phone, of course. He's got two satellite phones. So he's um, uh, doing SMSs uh, prior to the, getting this up and running. So so that's the new R called Grab Bag. <laughs> okay, thanks, Robin. Okay. <laughs> we'll see you again. Bye-bye. <laughs> Cut it, Jane Jane. Oh, she's trying to show you the bears and bits and pieces. Goodbye. <laughs>